The blank page is the enemy of creativity. I'm Daniel Whittington. I am the chancellor at Wizard Academy and Whiskey Marketing School. That's not entirely how people think of when they think creative. Often when you're starting out or you're in the early stages and you're learning about rules in high school and, and they have a class called creative writing. <laughs> and what you're sort of taught in that era and that vibe is like, well, there's the rules version of life with writing and poetry and analyzing. And then there's a the creative version where you just, anything goes and there are no boundaries and there are no rules. And so people don't understand that the most powerful creative environment by far is one where you have constraints and limitations and boundaries. If I sit down and hand you a piece of paper and say, hey, write something good, you'll be there for the next three days. But if I say, I want you to write three sentences, each one starting with the letter L, and I want it to be about breakfast cereal, <laughs> right? Well, bam, all of a sudden you've got some weird, very weird, I don't know what we're writing about, but you've got some very weird rules, and that little prompt and that little wall it just sort of gets you into motion, yeah? Now, at a certain point, you wanna throw off the constraints and find out where it breaks, but, but, ooh, man! Sorry, I'm gonna come back to this, but that one just caught me off guard. That is punchy. Okay, so, when I got to Wizard Academy, I learned about third gravitating bodies, which I talked in in the last video, and, there's a section in class where Roy Williams went through and analyzed all these different famous hit songs. And he showed how all the hit songs have a third gravitating body all the time. There are always three things being balanced and one of them is always unexpected. Or as Chris Maddox says, until you get that third ball in the air, you aren't juggling. <laughs> and uh, we're standing to the side of class during class. I'd only been at the academy for about a year. And I asked Roy, hey, have you ever used what you teach about third gravitating bodies to write music instead of analyze music? And he turned to me and said, that's your job, you're gonna do that. And uh, luckily, I'd, I mean, I'd spent the last two decades as a touring and performing and studio musician, but still it was like, oh, really, great. So. That's the premise, right? Hey, go write an album that ex that was all third gravitating bodies and uses everything we teach at Wizard Academy. Well, crap, where do you even begin with that? And I stood there frozen for a second and then he went back to teaching and I just sort of sat in the back of the room going like, well, he dropped the gauntlet, I gotta do something. And at the end of the day, he came back to me and he goes, here's the thing. Left to your own devices, you're gonna choose music you prefer, and music you like, and write things and expected things. So I am gonna draw some rules around you. You can only do covers, and you can only do covers that I choose of the cheesiest, most candy pop hit songs from the 60s and 70s. And then you have to make them dark and moody and heavy and rock. And I went, oh, okay, okay. Now I've got some, now I've got some rules. And I went back to the recording studio and I'll tell you what happened in, in a second. First, let's talk about Monotani Still Works Double Peated Malt. And this is a gift from Ken Myers. Thank you, Ken. Cheers to you. This is a um, uh, distillery that is um, actually up in Pennsylvania and they did this for the Philadelphia Whiskey Society. And so you can't get this specific bottle, but they have malt and uh, Monotania is doing really cool stuff. This was specifically a Simpsons peated malt that they ran and then aged in, I think that means pot still, but they aged it in uh, used American oak for two and a half years, 28 months, and then they moved it into an Ardbeg barrel, a barrel that previously held Ardbeg, and so they call it double peated because it was peated whiskey and then uh, finished in a peated whiskey barrel. And I tell you, when you pick it up, it is pungent uh, to the point of being like meat savory. Um, it goes so far beyond smoky <laughs> that it almost smells like applewood bacon. Have you ever had, or hickory smoke, have you ever had smoked bacon? And then you open it up and it's like this like overly tangy, meaty, but charred, but 
there's the bacon has that kind of sweetness to it. That's the thing about bacon is even without sugar or glazing, when you bake, when you uh, fry it, there's a sweetness to the meat that sort of comes through in bacon. This takes a little getting used to. I recommend letting that sit in the glass for at least as long as I just did. Now I'm finally getting behind to the, like, wow. It's almost a, like, a molasses-coated fruit. Woo! Wow, okay. Whoa! That's the sourness. I was trying to figure out, there's a sour note in the nose. And when I drank it, I tasted it. So this tastes like liquid smoke. <laughs> and, but there's a sour note that's in there and it tastes exactly like grabbing a piece of barley out of a grain bag and chewing on it, which you'll sometimes do when you're distilling and you get fresh grain in. You'll grab a handful of malt and just pop a few into your mouth and the malt barley, and it just tastes like grain. Um, but it's kind of a tangy barley note, which unless you've done that, you wouldn't really know. Um, that tangy barley note is in there. Now I'm getting like a coffee cream on top of that. But in the palate, it tastes like honey-coated, ashy, smoked barley grain. I think um, for the cuts, I would have let that age a little longer, but that's, rem that's remarkable and uh, very unique. Ooh, that's gonna linger. Okay, so I go back to my recording studio and Roy sends me his first three songs and they were um, Dancing Queen, uh, <laughs> Staying Alive, and Nights on Broadway. Now, I don't know, you wouldn't necessarily know my music from before, but none of those songs were songs I would ever choose in a million years. Uh, Nights on Broadway has incredible sound uh, when Chicago was did some cool stuff with that um, staying alive is obviously the classic ooh, 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 staying alive. and then dancing queen you are the dancing and and I just sat in my studio and thought damn it what do I do with this I mean I have the rules right but I have months to get this project going I was recording it at night in my own studio and playing almost all the instruments and how do you get started okay if I say here Staying alive, sit down, make it dark. Crap. So I needed some false constraints. So I sat down and I figured out the progression, which I had to learn for staying alive. And as I was screwing around with an acoustic, I realized it was the same progression as Neil Young, Heart of Gold. And in that moment in my head, I went, crap, I know how to do this. I know how we do this. I just steal all the cool shit from all the bands I like <laughs> and apply it to these pop candy songs. So I reinterpreted Staying Alive as Neil Young's Heart of Gold. It kept the lyrics and melody and everything, but recorded it as if it came off of a Neil Young album. And instantly it was totally, it worked. I could not believe it, but it worked. And so I went down that path further and further. Every time I got handed a song, I figured out the chord progression, and then I thought, what chord progression do I know of this in music that I love? And then I would go find that artist, and I would just steal the artist's vibe and tones and guitar parts and apply it to this hit pop song. And my, as it went through all those machinations in my head, it became something totally new. And so my recommendation with you is... is don't, when you're trying to be creative and start something, don't get held back by the idea that you need to be open and unique and truly innovative. Just figure out the things you love and figure out how to take the pieces of that and make it your own. Uh, I, Pablo Picasso is quoted as saying this sentence, which is, good artists um, borrow, but the great artists steal. No one knows if he actually said it. It's been quoted by a few other people. But the point is, straight stealing from your heroes, <laughs> you'll never replicate what they do, right? You could give me the edges guitar, the edges pedals, the edges amp, and you can pick me on stage with the rest of you too. I'm still not gonna sound like the edge, even if I play all of his parts exactly, because the thing that makes us unique and interesting is our flaws. And so anytime you approach something, you're gonna do it through your 
interpretation and your own flawed, broken way of applying it. And no matter how much you try to copy somebody else, it's gonna become your own version of it. Don't be afraid of that. So here's to stealing other people's great ideas. Uh, I can't believe I'm putting that on the internet. Thank you for hanging out with me. I'm really glad you're here. Cheers. Cheers.